Hey guys, Dr. Deal here. Today I want to talk about long C word 19. So the reason why I want to get into this is because a lot of people are struggling and in fact Finland recently announced that this is their biggest health issue. It's not current or active C19 disease, but people who have had it and are suffering with symptoms that are persisting. And this is different from an infectious disease or from an epidemiologist perspective, this is really a lifestyle medicine expertise perspective because that's really what you need to treat this condition as you'll see. So let's get into it. So what is long C19? So essentially it is symptoms that can happen during active C19 that linger beyond 12 weeks. So obviously everyone kind of knows what the symptoms of C19 are, but sometimes these persist in people even after they resolve the acute infection. So what are these symptoms? So the most common is fatigue by far, that happens to almost up to 50% of people. And then the other common symptoms are mental health issues. So this includes brain fog, where it's difficulty concentrating, depression, anxiety, difficulty sleeping. So a lot of neurological symptoms. And then in addition to that, you can also have olfactory or gustatory symptoms. What that means is a decrease in sensation in your taste, and then you might not smell as well, and you might not taste things as much. And then related to that, you can have some gastrointestinal symptoms as well. Some nausea, gastritis, difficulty digestion, kind of bloating. So a variety of those types of symptoms as well. And then there's also cardiac symptoms that people can develop, including arrhythmias and high blood pressure. There's also been some cases of long C19 causing diabetes or increased risk of diabetes, and then also potentially musculoskeletal pain as well. So there's such a wide variety of symptoms and we'll get into why that is in a second. So now that you have an understanding of what the symptoms are, how do you actually diagnose it? There isn't a consensus on exactly how to diagnose it, but essentially if you have one or more of those symptoms that persist beyond 12 weeks after you have long C19, you are considered to have long C19. There are certain blood tests that we can do to confirm this, or at least to give us more evidence that it is suggestive that someone is suffering from this. Specifically, there's something called inflammatory markers that we look at. So before we go into inflammatory markers, let's first explain what chronic inflammation is. People understand when something triggers your immune system, it will amount a response and it'll try to treat that foreign substance. So for example, if you get an infection or if you get a wound, your body's immune system sends molecules there called immune cells or inflammatory cells to try to go to that site of injury to try to quell or treat the injury or to fight the foreign substance and by doing that it can mitigate the symptom and treat the acute problem. Now inflammation is great for acute problems and that's really where it shines but the problem is sometimes these inflammatory cells continue to go to the site of injury or to the site of problem eventually causing what's called chronic inflammation. We don't exactly understand why this happens but there's a variety of risk factors that we'll get into that can increase the risk for this and essentially what happens is you have these immune cells, these white blood cells that are just going into the site of injury or into the site of damage and persisting even though they're supposed to just be there for a short period of time. And so once you get chronic inflammation, it can lead to a whole sort of problems. So what happens is those immune cells build up and whichever body part they're building up in, they can cause inflammation and cause dysfunction of that organ system. So for example, if it builds up in your heart, inflammatory cells, it can cause cardiac dysfunction and that can lead to increased blood pressure or increased risk of heart disease. If the inflammatory cells build up in your brain, that can lead to increased risk of depression or increased risk of dementia or Alzheimer's. So the point is these inflammatory cells are only meant to be there for an acute short period of time, but when they build up and they persist, that's really one of these two issues. So now that you understand what chronic inflammation is, we need to get into how it relates back to long C19. So what's happened after your body has fought off C19, your body obviously mounted an immune response, but this can sometimes lead to these chronic inflammatory cells going all throughout your body. We don't know exactly why this is, but they can go up all over the place. They can go into your brain, they can go into your heart, the muscle cells, into your pancreas, and then these can cause all sorts of symptoms. And this is really the root of the issue with long C19. So now that we know that chronic inflammation is one of the hallmarks of it, that's why we can do blood tests to check for inflammatory markers. So there's one called high sensitivity C-reactive protein, and there's one called ESR, which are the two most common ones, but there are also other markers of inflammation like ferritin, uric acid, and homocysteine, and there's a whole host of others, but those are the primary ones that I often use to check for inflammation to see if someone may be suffering as a result of long C19 and having these elevated inflammatory markers. 
Another thing we can also check are hormones because there was a recent study that came out that showed that long C19 can actually lead to low testosterone in men. And this could be one of the reasons why people experience all these different symptoms as well, because we know testosterone is so important for reducing inflammation and also for helping with men's health. And similarly for women, it can cause irregular periods as some people have seen with even the vaccine that can happen, that can also happen with long C19. And so checking the hormones can be important to see in the estrogen and progesterone balance and also to check something like cortisol, which is a stress hormone to make sure that your body is regulating that okay. So now that you understand what the symptoms are, how to diagnose it, and why chronic inflammation is really the root cause of the disease, we can get into the actual treatment. So first let's talk about treating it from a conventional medical perspective. So as medical physicians, we're trained to treat symptoms and we're great at that, but we're not great at necessarily treating the root cause. So first let's talk about the conventional medical treatment in terms of treating the symptom. Common symptom that often people have in addition to the fatigue is shortness of breath with exertion or chest discomfort or tightness even when they exercise, even long after the virus has resolved. So one treatment you can do for this is what's called a steroidal puffer. And so there's one called Ventolin or one called Simbacord, and you can use that before you exercise to help open up your airways and they can help reduce inflammation in the airways as well. So that's a treatment that you can do, but again, it's more managing the symptoms, not so much treating the root cause. And similarly, there are other drugs that can help in terms of reducing inflammation. There's one called fluoxetine that recently got approved by FDA because it can actually help reduce the severity of COVID. But the reason for that is actually because fluoxetine, even though it's an antidepressant, it actually has an anti-inflammatory effect. And that's what we've realized with a lot of successful drugs for example, statins, which are cholesterol lower medications and even antidepressants, the reason why they're so successful is because they reduce inflammation. In terms of treating the root cause, we need to treat the chronic inflammation. And so we know from chronic fatigue syndrome and from fibromyalgia that a lot of those patients suffer from chronic inflammation as well. And so we do have some research from that that we can draw on to help us treat patients suffering from long C19. So the firstly, one of the most important things that I would recommend is graded exercise. So graded exercise means gradual progression in exercise under supervision. The reason being supervision is because most people don't know how to periodize and how to program themselves to make progress over time without stressing their body too much. And it's really hard to do that unless you're a very experienced fitness health coach or unless you have years of experience and you've studied this exercise science. It's much more complicated than just doing a workout or following some Zumba class or online class or Peloton, like those are all great, but they're not gonna be a graded exercise program for your body. You need a coach to help you do that. And so that's, a, that's really the difference. And there's actually been research on this for chronic fatigue syndrome, and that's, been, that's what's been shown to be effective for that. In terms of treating chronic inflammation, the best is lifestyle. So we need to, we talked about exercise, so let's talk about nutrition. I won't go too much into it because I already made a YouTube video about nutrition and inflammation. So you can check that out on how to figure out which nutritional paradigm you should be taking in order to reduce inflammation and how to figure that out. So check out that video. I think that'll be very helpful if you are suffering from long C19. Now the other component is sleep. If you are having issues sleeping, then instead of taking those drugs that we talked about earlier, which may have potentially a lot of side effects, there's something called GABA and valerian root which can help with sleep as well. And they're natural and they don't have those same addictive side effects. Moreover, there's actually been studies showing that people who have long C19 actually have low levels of GABA. GABA is a neurotransmitter in your brain and it helps you relax. And so when the levels become low, it's harder to relax. And so by taking GABA, you can help promote relaxation. And, and long C19, because it's lower, we know it's one thing that may help. Now, I'm, I'm a big fan of valerian root as well because it works similar to those benzodiazepines but doesn't have the same addictive potential. Personally, this is what I use. I don't use it regularly, but I do use it once or twice a week when I have a hard time sleeping. Um, and, if I, and I have recommended it to some of my athletes who have had long C19. The other component of treating chronic inflammation is really gut health. And so gut health, there is a separate video I could do about this, but the biggest piece of advice I can give is to check out a book called Healthy Gut, Healthy You. It has a very good protocol in there in terms of step-by-step -step on how to find out and optimize your gut health. And this is a step-by-step -step approach. And the reason why this is so important is because your gut is the front line barrier before molecules can go into your bloodstream. So there is something called leaky gut, which is essentially intestinal permeability, where there's almost like leakages or small holes or perforations in the intestines, which can increase inflammation throughout the whole body. 
And so that's why it's so important to have a healthy gut and it ties in with the inflammation as well. So one of the biggest issues is mental health and brain fog. And these kind of go hand in hand because it's actually related to what's called neuroinflammation. So neuroinflammation is what can cause mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, as well as brain fog or difficulty concentrating. And the reason why I have expertise in this is because a lot of people with post-concussion syndrome have similar type of symptoms. And of course, as a sports doctor, I see that quite often. So I've actually had some of my athletes have long C19 and had lingering symptoms. And so the way we treat it is a combination of lifestyle modifications, which we already talked about, and supplements. And so what supplements do we usually recommend? So first is omega-3 fish oil, about one tablespoon a day, vitamin D3, between two to 5,000 IUs a day, and then turmeric or curcumin, which is a natural anti-inflammatory, which is quite potent. And the dosing can vary depending on the type of supplement, but you just wanna make sure you have one that has bioperine in it or black, pack, or black pepper extract, which is highly bioavailable, meaning it absorbs properly. Without it, it doesn't really absorb and doesn't really do much. And then in addition to that, there are some secondary supplements you can take like N-acetylcysteine, which is an antioxidant and can also help reduce inflammation and has been shown to help with neuroinflammation. But really the biggest stuff is honestly the lifestyle because something like a Mediterranean diet has been shown to help with depression and reducing neuroinflammation. So if you are suffering from brain fog, try to treat the neuroinflammation and that's the root cause of this. Unfortunately, with our fragmented healthcare system, there's no specialist for long C19. So there's a lot of people out there suffering. So hopefully you found this video helpful. And if you know anyone who's had it and is suffering with these symptoms, share it with them. And please like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.